welcome to this wonderful week. We've been doing a Bible study all week long on this Holy Week. We, we started last Sunday and just went every day saying, this is what happened, this is what Jesus did, this was what he taught, and uh, it's been a powerful week, it really has. You know, we started out with the idea that there's a reason for this week, long anticipated. You know, if you begin to look at the, at the history behind it, you're going to see that all throughout, throughout well, since the beginning, men were questioning, is this the Messiah? Is this the promised one that's going to come? Is this one the Savior of Israel? They were all looking for the Messiah to come. They weren't sure how it was going to come. They knew that the word had been given. God had given a word, but they had no clue how it might happen. They also misunderstood, as we do so many times, we think it's going to be in this form. They thought it was just going to be deliverance from Syria, from Rome, from whoever, whatever other oppressors was going to happen. The Messiah was going to come. He was going to set his throne up there at the throne of David, and he was going to rule basically the earth. He was going to set the promised people, Israel, he was going to set them up on top. But uh, they didn't understand their part, nor did they understand the part of the, of the Messiah. Number one, their part, and I think this is very important, they were simply schoolmasters. And the curriculum was the image of God being passed down from generation to generation until finally this, this word could be made flesh there with Mary. And so all through generation after generation, the prophecies came, the promises came, the expectation was high. Everyone was expecting it until finally... When, when the time was right, Jesus came, the Messiah came. And of course, when he finished what he was doing, then there was no more need for the law keeper, basically, the schoolmaster, those that kept everybody right in line. No longer are we under the law, but we have moved under grace. If you belong to Christ, your Abraham's seed, your heirs according to the promise. And uh, Galatians says, if you live by the, the law, then you have fallen from grace. So, so you're saved by one thing alone, and that is what Jesus did, not your ability to keep the rules. If you're determined to be a rule keeper, you better be better than you are, is all I got to tell you, because you're not going to make it. I'm, 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 I promise you're not going to make it. You're not that good, and uh, uh, neither am I. So I lean heavily upon the, what God has done for me, in me, and through me, through Jesus Christ. So we see that that. This week that we've seen, oh, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and now Friday has been prophesied. I would say the most important week in history because it is here that the redemption takes place. It's here that your life was changed. It's, it's in this week that everything that was began to dissipate and everything that is coming begin to grow. Very powerful time. And so I, I want to just pick up, because this is day six, and this is where we, we see the trial, the crucifixion, the death, and uh, burial that was done today. A lot of things happened on this day. Now, we saw yesterday that uh, Jesus went, he had the his final, the, you know, the Last Supper, basically. He went to the Garden of Eden. He was betrayed by Judas and uh uh, at that point, they took him to Caiaphas. They took him to the high priest. Now, what was the reason for that? Because Jesus was the final sacrifice offered under the Abrahamic covenant. But when you brought in during Passover, which was the only time it could happen, when you brought in the lambs into the temple area, they had to be examined by the priest to make sure that they were without blemish that they were without spot. Jesus was examined uh, all last night by the high priest. They asked him everything and they couldn't find anything. There was nothing that they could find that would actually accuse him until finally the, uh, the, the high priest said, I adjure you by God. And there was kind of a, a, a law at that time when, when the high priest demanded something like that, that you were, you were committed to answer. And he said, are you the Christ? Are you the son of God? And Jesus said, I am. That's when the high priest tore his clothes. 
he, um, he said, what further need do we have? And so the, they began to put him through a real rigorous uh, thing. Last night, we began to see how uh, uh, Peter denied the Lord. And today, now, th this being what we call Good Friday, is one of the most difficult days of Passion Week because this is where Christ's journey turned treacherous and, and uh, very painful in these final hours that led to his death. Now, it is also noteworthy that this was also a time when Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples who betrayed him, remember he took, he took the money that 30 pieces of silver was basically the cost of a slave, if you were to buy a slave, 30 pieces of silver, and uh, he took it back to the high priest and he said, I betrayed innocent blood. And of course, they didn't care. Their, their eyes were completely blinded. It had to happen. You know, I used to feel bad toward the high priest because I used to think, how evil are these people? I'm just telling you, mean-spirited evil. But the fact is, is their eyes had to be closed. And the reason is, had they not, had they not processed Jesus through this crucifixion, you and I would not know what it was to be born again. And they didn't know what it was. Now, the high priest did prophesy, and he said it's, it's very important that we understand that one man die for the sins of the people, that the whole nation perish not. That was a prophetic word. And uh, I don't know that he really realized that he was talking concerning Jesus, at least in this context. But uh, they, Judas took the money back to them, and he said, I betrayed innocent blood. They said, who cares? I mean, what's that to us? That doesn't mean anything to us. And so Judas threw it at their feet, and he went out and hanged himself. And the high priest, they took that money, and they went and bought a potter's field, which was prophesied. Uh, there was a prophetic word that came a thousand years earlier that said the money that they will take from the betrayal is going to be used in a potter's field but it was known after that as the field of blood. And uh, that was the place that, uh, that was purchased with the betrayal money from Judas. But Judas, he just went out and hanged himself. Now, you know, there's a lot of speculation concerning Judas. Um, you know, I, I, Jesus made a statement concerning him. He said it, it would be better that he had not been born. It really would have been better. I'm not certain exactly what all that means. I think we have a tendency to make judgments about people that are what I call above our pay grade. What happened to Judas? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. The Bible does not say what happened to him from a spiritual standpoint. And I know that there's a lot of ground that people stand on on both sides of that. I tend to always lean toward mercy and grace. And I will say, one thing that I know about God is he is good and he is kind and he is fair. Now, the fact that it was prophesied that Judas would do this seems that he was kind of trapped in and had to do it, whether he wanted to or whether he didn't. Now, of course, that is even arguable. And I'm not, I, I, let me just say, I'm not trying to land on one side or the other on this. Because like I said, it's, it's, that's a little above my pay grade and yours. I, I've seen people, I have actually seen people attend the funerals of someone and make a statement like, well, that person is now in hell. What a horrible, horrible thing to say. I want to say, how do you know that? How, how do you know that? How would you know that that person is in that awful condition right now. How would you know? You weren't there at the little closing moments. You don't know what their heart said. You don't know what Christ did for them or how they might have responded. You don't know. But we sometimes get just a little arrogant in our making judgments about other people and what happened to them. Now, you know, it obviously states that, that Judas was in trouble. But I, I, I encourage you to be cautious. You know, it's one of those things where in this situation, I think you should be swift to hear and slow to speak. You know what I'm saying? I, I don't know that it's pleasing to the Lord for us just to throw out statements that are very cruel and harsh statements about the eternal soul of someone. 
you know, we might be mad at somebody and, and wish some bad thing on them. But when you start thinking about eternity, guys, that's a big deal. And I just think we should, I think in those cases, and even with Judas, whom it looks like is in serious trouble here, I really think we need to be very quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. I think, I think we need to reserve judgment in areas that is not under our authority. So there's a lot of times we want to make judgments over people that they're not under our authority, but yet we usurp authority over them by making judgments about them. And that's just wrong. I'm just telling you, that is a wrong position. But I do know one thing, that this was a terrible thing. Judas Iscariot, he hanged himself early this morning on that Friday morning, and it was just a, it was a horrible thing. Um, that, that it's, that's a sobering thing. It's a, it's a heartbreaking thing. If things like that don't break your heart, it's very possible that maybe something might be wrong with you and you need to stop and examine yourself lest we ever seem to celebrate the wound or the hurt or the loss or the destruction of anybody. God help us, help us to change, okay? So that's what took place this morning. Judas went and hanged himself. And uh, it, was, it was before nine o'clock, uh, Jesus, well, I'm telling you something, he endured the shame and the accusations, the condemnation, um, all of the things that they did to him. Um, they brought him before Pilate. There's a lot of things about Pilate that I've been rethinking that uh, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I would love to bring up. Maybe I can talk about that at another time. But uh, they took him before Pilate, and basically Pilate acquitted him three times. I mean, Pilate said three times, I find no fault in him. I find no fault. But, but the situation was pushed by the chief priest and the religious leaders. But then again, it had to be, didn't it? It had to be. Um, that, that, that situation had to... It's almost as though their eyes were blinded that they could not see what they were doing. And the, but they had to be. Uh, they, they, had to, they had to push that thing through. And they brought him, and finally, Pilate just gave up. I mean, he just realized, I'm not going to be able to, because what they said was, is that the, the, the hook at the end was, they told Pilate, they said, if you release him, you are not a friend of Rome. We are servants to Rome. Isn't it amazing that those people, they, they suddenly became and, and accepted the position as servanthood under Rome. They'd never done that before, but they did then. And they even made a statement. He said, I don't want their blood on my hands. And they said, let his blood be on us and on and our children. Now that, to be honest with you, is one of the most frightening statements that someone could make. So you have authority in your house. You have authority uh, in, in your family to where you can open the door to things that are, are good or bad. And when they said, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. That that is a that's that's a frightening statement to make. Well, well, Herod, uh, Pilate, you know, because I mean, he didn't even send him off to Herod. He said, I, "I don't want anything to do with this guy. Send him to Herod." Well, Herod was also blinded. He didn't know what to do. Herod would have let him go in a millisecond. I'm just telling you right now, he would have done it because he felt so bad over beheading John the Baptist. He was tricked into it. He was sorrowful. He believed in John the Baptist. He believed John the Baptist was a, 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 a prophet, a miracle worker. And now he's heard all of these things about Jesus who raised the dead, who opened blinded eyes. And when Jesus went to Herod, he because Herod just said, show me anything, just show me. I mean, Herod would have released him. I'm just telling you, he would have. But Jesus would not even respond to him. Everything Herod said, he wouldn't look at him he wouldn't respond to him until finally out of frustration. And I think Herod just said, just get him out of here because I don't know what's going on here and send him back. I mean, that's a real interesting concept to go over, but he sent him back to, to, uh, to Pilate. Pilate had him uh, scourged. 
Um, I, don't, I don't know if you've ever seen The Passion of the Christ. Uh, boy, that was a, God, that was a heavy movie. I, uh, I, I bought the movie when it first came out and it's still in the plastic. I just couldn't watch it again. It was one of the heaviest things I've ever seen in my life. We rented out a theater and just invited people to come. And so I had to sit through like four of those. <laughs> and by the time I got out of there watching that thing four times, I needed counseling. <laughs> I was our train wreck. Oh my God. But it was an amazing description of what took place during that time of, of scourging and what happened. And of course they scourged him. They, they put a, a purple robe on him, took his other garments, which was prophesied, and they, they didn't want to tear them in half to divide between the soldiers, so they cast lots. We're going we're to gamble. Then the, the best guy, he gets the entire garment. I mean, it was, a, it was an expensive garment that Jesus had. And so they put a, a crown of thorns on his head. They, they bowed before him. They mocked him. And then they took him back and uh, led him off to be crucified. And... Uh, Wow, it, it, he carried his cross to Calvary, was the Bible calls the place of the skull. Uh, I was there when I was in Israel. I, but each time I go there, and there, there literally is a, it's the the front of a of a mountain. Uh, you can you can go on Google and you can pull pictures of it up, but the holes that are in this thing really resembles a skull. Uh, I know that there's some that say, no, he was actually crucified on the other side of town uh, where they have a Catholic uh, place built. I don't know. I just always said the place of the skull, and I know that this outside place is a place where th that looks like a skull. And it also says that they took him from there to a nearby garden, and the garden right there where the burial place is, is right next door. I mean, literally, it's right there where, and, and so it's a, it is a uh, amazing, um, amazing, if you ever get a chance to go, you should go. But they took him to that place and they nailed him to a cross and raised him up on that hill uh, to be crucified. That was right there by a road that went by and everybody from every nation could see people being crucified. Of course, that was a real uh, warning to anyone that wanted to give a problem to, to the Romans. This was going to happen to you. But uh, they, they had him there and uh, uh, he, he, was, he was there until uh, about three o'clock. He was there from about nine o'clock in the morning to about three o'clock. And the final statements on, on the cross that Jesus made, he he actually had three statements. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Um, and Luke 23 also said that his last words were, uh, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Um, of course, he had a conversation with one of the thieves uh, where he said, this day, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. But uh, the, his final words uh, to the father was, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know. They don't understand. And their, uh, his last word was, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. You know, I, I want to just quickly jump back. <clears throat> I guess I'd never really thought of it like this. But when, when Jesus prayed, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing, do you think God answered that prayer? Just a question. When Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Do you think that, do you think that God answered that prayer? I would, I would have a tendency to say, yeah. I, I would have a tendency to say, if Jesus prayed that, I would say, yeah, I would think that he, God answered that prayer. Well, in that case, I would have to put Peter and and uh, Judas, uh, Pilate, uh, the chief priests, the Roman soldiers, all of the people that were involved in this entire thing 
I would say would have to fall under the boundaries of that prayer. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they were doing, and they didn't. Peter didn't know what he was doing. Judas didn't know what he was doing. The high priest didn't know what they were doing. The soldiers, they had no idea what was going on. They were just soldiers from Rome. I mean, you understand? And he prayed that. I have to believe, and I embraced. Now, you might say you're wrong. Well, it probably wouldn't be the first time that I was ever wrong about something, but I think this is at least something to consider, that Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. Who was he talking about? Uh, who, who was, there, are we talking about everybody that was involved in this crucifixion that brought Jesus to the place that now he's hanging on that tree? That's, that's a really good thing to think about, isn't it? And of course, Jesus is up there on the cross and in about the ninth hour, which is three o'clock, Jesus breathed in his last breath and he died. He gave up the ghost. He went prematurely. I don't, they, they really weren't expecting Jesus to die there because they, they, they said, you know, the Passover's coming. We're going to be doing something religious, and we don't want our hijack here to mess up our church service. So anyway, they said, you know, let's, let's end these guys' lives. So they sent them to break their legs. When they came to Jesus, they said, man, he's already dead. So they pierced him in the side. Out came blood and water. And uh, I, I think it's E.W. Kenyon that, that had done some study on that. And the blood began to coagulate and separate, is, is my understanding, and separate the serum from the blood. And when they pierced his side, it pierced that sack that, that, that because Jesus... He, he didn't die from the wounds on the cross. He died from, a, from a, a ruptured heart. His heart burst. And when they pierced the sack there where his heart was, the blood that came out from there was blood and water, so to speak, the, the serum and the, and, and the water. And so whenever Jesus died, they pierced him, he said, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. There was an earthquake and the, it got dark. I, I, you know, it, I mean, it, it, was, it was dark like night, it was scary dark. And the earth shook. And of course it tore up there in the temple, but the, the veil that was in the temple that would separate that which was holy from that which was outside was torn from the top to the bottom like giant hands took and ripped it in half. It's quite an incredible thing, ripped it in half. And basically what that was saying was is the separation between God and man was now gone. No more is there a separation between God and man. You, and, and if that was the holy place then behind that veil, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came and blew into that place, the, the, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And Paul made a statement later. He said, you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. So now it was no more a box. It was no more a room. It was no more just a little temple. Now you're the temple. Now you carry that, that. See, that's what God wanted in the first place. Everything that was there in the temple and what we would know as the ark or the veil or whatever, all of that was a substitute temple until the real temple was completed, which was you. Now you are the holy of holies, if you can receive that. I know that a lot of people don't want to do that because all they can think is, I'm no good. Nah, not me. I'm not any good. Well, you got to understand that, that, that that's what took place. And that was why Jesus came. Jesus didn't come to just deal with your sin. What he came to do was to die as the final sacrifice under the Abrahamic covenant. So you got to understand that and reposition us to where we could actually have that thing to where we say, I am born again. That means born from this to this. I was that, but I'm not that anymore. I've been born again. 
I'm not an old sinner saved by grace. I was a sinner. I was saved by grace, but now I am the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. And when Jesus spoke to that man on the, that, that, uh, that uh, thief on the cross, he said, I say to you today, you'll be with me in paradise. That word today is emphatic. As a matter of fact, if you'll even notice, look in your King James Version, the word today is capitalized. You know, it's, it's like they really wasn't sure exactly what to do with that. Because what happens to a person when they die? Well, he was saying, I say today, that's like saying, I say today, uh, you're going, I'm going to be with you in Dallas. Well, I'm not in Dallas right now, but I'm saying to you today, I'm going to be with you in Dallas. When we get there, I'm going to be with you. That's what he was saying. Because Jesus didn't just, the, the physical death was not all that was needed to redeem you. If that was the case, then, then Abel could have paid it. Cain could have paid it. Uh, Enoch could have paid it. Uh, anybody could have paid it if just the physical death. But see, you weren't physically separated from God. You were spiritually separated from God. Paul said we were all by nature the children of wrath. Now that's a powerful word, isn't it? We were all by nature. And David said in the book of Psalms, he said, behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. So you have to understand that, that we, we were dealing with spiritual death, which spiritual death, you're not going to cease to exist. You're creating the likeness, the image of God. You're going to be eternal. Spiritual death isn't that you cease to exist. Spiritual death is separation from life. Spiritual death is separation from God, eternal separation from God. My Lord, what must that be? I, I, I don't know. But Jesus had to go and pay the price. That's why David made the prophecy. He said, you will not leave my soul in hell. Now think about that for a few moments. Jesus, he paid every bit of it. And he went in, and I'm just telling you something, he bankrupted hell. He just did. And he emptied paradise, which paradise was the holding tank for the righteous dead. When people died in those days, they couldn't go into the presence of God. Otherwise, what was the purpose in Jesus even coming? Fact is, that was a place where they were kept in the, in the lap basically of Abraham because of the sin condition that they were in. And they couldn't go into heaven, but their sins were, were, uh, uh, their sins were covered. They were atoned. Now, when Jesus came, he didn't atone for our sins. He remitted our sins. Uh, the Bible said he erased, he eradicated the note that was written against us, took in, taking it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. He erased it. You know what that means? I want you to listen to me. There's not even proof that you ever were a sinner. Every documentation against you has been erased. <laughs> you think about that for a minute. <laughs> you know, if you're doing business in some store and you want to go in there and talk to them about, they, they have a record of the fact that you did business with them. But Jesus took the, he took that, that, that note that was against us and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. He erased it. He eradicated it. There's no proof that you ever were a sinner. There's no proof. Somebody, Satan brings an accusation against you and says, you're just no sin. Say, prove it. Prove that I ever was. He can't do it. He can't do it. I'm a, all the old records are taken out of the way. And now you are a new creature. If you could just rest in that and enjoy it, instead of always trying to talk yourself out of it, I just do not understand why some people would sit and continually try to convince themselves and everybody else how no good they are. Don't you believe in what Jesus did? I'm just telling you, all of the things that we've seen this week has been powerful, where Jesus literally, he, the 2 Corinthians 5.21, he who knew no sin, that's Jesus, became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I can say, I am righteous. 
Somebody say, how can you say that? Because it's not based on my works. It's based on my trust in him. I'm in Christ. Read the book of Philippians. You'll find, it's amazing, in Colossians, how many times you'll find the word in whom, in him. That's the bottom line. My, I, my righteousness is not based on my works. It's based on my faith in Christ that I'm in him. And when God looks at you, he doesn't see you. He sees the blood that was shed for you. He sees Jesus. That's how, and, and I live in God's presence. I'm justified. You know what just mean, justified means? Just as though sin never existed. I'm, I am as guiltless in the presence of God as Jesus himself, because I'm not there based on my works. I'm based on what he did. You understand that? I am as righteous as Jesus because it's in him that I live and I move and I have my being. <laughs> oh man, I'm telling you, it gets good. And and, and of course, uh, I, I see if I can do something tomorrow, but I'm just telling you something. Jesus wrecked the devil. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's incredible what he did. But it, let me get back to Friday because... Uh, I, it's so easy for me to get way ahead of myself, but by six o'clock, by six o'clock. Now, if that were if that were this time, we'd we'd be very close there by by six o'clock. I mean, because three o'clock, uh, you know, that our, uh, uh, Joseph of Arimathea he's taking the body down, and by six o'clock that evening, Nicodemus and Joseph they took bodies down from the Jesus body down and put him in the crawl in in the tomb, and there's so many. Incredible things. We'll talk about that tomorrow. I don't normally do the weekend, but I'm going to this week because I just want to talk to you about our Lord Jesus, who he is and what he did. <laughs> oh, no wonder we can say, death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? <laughs> oh my God, I am telling you, Jesus, but... Do you, <laughs> he he did it in its fullness. Jesus now is lifted up, and he said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all the judgment that was falling on man. I'll draw all judgment to myself, and he did. All my judgment, all my guilt, all my separation from God. He became what I was so I could become what he is. <laughs> it's awful good. I'm just telling you right now, it's good. I'm gonna be back tomorrow. We're gonna to finish up. Well, I say finish up. We're gonna see what happens from the, from the cross to the throne. We're gonna talk about that a little bit. It's pretty powerful. It really is. Love you guys. I wanna say thank you for joining me. Thank you for taking a few moments of your time and just sharing your, your, what's precious, your time with me. Uh, you can please push like, push share, and, and subscribe. I would deeply, deeply appreciate it.